Okay, so the last part of basic graphs or like the week five graph topics is some other graph algorithms on undirected unweighted graphs. So week seven, we complicate the graph structure a bit, but right now we're just looking at the last graph algorithms on these simpler structures. Um, and the main things we're going to be looking at are cycle checking, connected components, Hamiltonian paths and circuits, and Euler paths and circuits. This is a very um, kind of high level uh, topic. I, we, I don't think we really ever expect you to code these up which just reminded me on the previous topic for graph traversals that we do actually give you all the code for this stuff. So um, we actually give you the the BFSQ and the DFS stack and the DFS recursive stuff. So if you want to go play around with the code, you can go and do that. Um, it's all there. You don't have to write it from scratch. But for this stuff, we're going to talk about a few algorithms that are a bit more high level. And again, it's cycle checking, connected components, Hamiltonian paths, and Euler paths, and then that's it. That's what we're talking about. So the first one is cycle checking. Uh, and this is essentially like trying to see if a graph has a cycle in it. So def like the definition we give... Yeah, I know it's pronounced Euler paths. I just don't really care. I'm sorry. Um, you know, it's like... Uh, what's, what's another word? It's like people that pronounce... Uh, what do they pronounce? GIFs as GIFs. I'm just like, you know, I got bigger problems to worry about in life. Um, so we define a graph as a cycle. If at any point in the graph, we have a path. <laughs> I'm going to get stabbed by everyone soon. If, if anywhere in the graph, we have a path that has a length greater than two, um, where the start vert... <laughs> Sorry. Um, where the start vertex is equal to the end vertex... And we haven't used any edge more than once. So it actually makes sense. Like, <laughs> sorry, I hate when the chat makes me laugh. Um, we kind of have like, you know, two nodes over here. So you can't have a cycle in a graph if there's just like a path of one length one, right? Because this is just a path of length one. You can't cycle with one step. Uh, however, you can have a path of say length three that looks like this. So this is a cycle because it has a path of length two. The start vertex is the end vertex. So for instance, if I start here, I go round like that. And we haven't used any edge in the graph. We haven't traversed any edge in the graph more than once. So, you know, you kind of know that intuitively, but that's like the formal definition of it. Um, now, any graph can have many cycles, okay? Um, this graph here, for instance, 0, 1, 2, 3, it has a whole bunch of cycles. One of the cycles is from 0 to 1 to 2 to 0. Another cycle is from 2 to 3 to 0 to 2. Another cycle is from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 0. So any graph can have a large number of cycles. Um, the bigger the graph is, typically the more cycles there are, and it, it kind of blows out non-linearly. I don't know the specific mathematic relationship. I guess it would depend on the nature of the graph. I don't think there'd be any clear one, but um, a graph like this has a huge number of cycles because you can imagine in this graph, you can go from one to zero, one, two, five, four, six, three, zero, back like that. Okay. Um, so there's a whole bunch here. Zero, one, four, zero, zero, three, four, zero, zero, three, six, four, zero, tons and tons and tons and tons of cycles. In terms of cycle checking, <clears throat> Typically, there's like two stages we work with in cycle checking. The first one is that um, checking if there's actually a cycle. Um, the actual checking a cycle between two vertices and then looping over all possible vertex combinations. So the uh, if we look at this algorithm, this is a one algorithm that is in two parts. So the first one is we first um, we have a graph and we want to check for this graph, if there is a cycle about a particular vertex. Um, so here you could say, okay, in this graph here, does the node zero have, um, have any cycles? Is there any paths you can find through the graph that end up back where they started at zero? Now, again, I'm not going to step through this in, in extensive detail, <laughs> in extensive detail. Uh, but basically, 
um, the key thing to kind of understand is that we use a depth first search in these cases to um, find the cycles and this kind of makes sense I think when you think about um, like a depth first search job is to kind of go code deeper and, and hopefully loop itself back because um, like with a visited list a, de a depth first search a breadth first a break first search or whatever you think I'm saying um, could be like a little bit troublesome but in these in these implementations we're just dealing with a DFS so the actual has cycle here is looping over all the different vertices um, and it's trying to check I'm just having a look here just triple checking yeah so this one I would love to run for you. I think I decided that I didn't want to spend the time running it because I don't think this is a massive part of the course compared to like breadth first search and depth first search. Though, um, the again, if you were to dump this into some editor. God damn it. Why? Why are you so difficult? Um, if you were to dump this into an editor, then remember, it would just be all part of the same file, um, except you'd have to forward declare this one here. Um, where again, your depth first search cycle check. Yeah, this doesn't... So, while it says this doesn't really make sense to me, I guess I'll ask my tutor. Yeah, so, I mean, again, I'm not, I don't want to spend much time on this in the lectures because it's not like a massive critical part of the course. I'm not going to like trace through it with an algorithm or whatever. Um, your tutors might want to go through it. You could talk to them about it. But again, anything we don't go through extensively in lectures tends to not be a major part of like assignments. Or if it is like in an exam and stuff, usually it's a little bit more conceptual. Um, so let me see how we go for the rest of time. And then we might loop back to this at the end. Okay. And we might step through it in a bit more detail. But let's, let's see how we go. Um, but part two of this... Um, which is connected components is so a, a kind of a, a thing you need to do with graphs um, which you probably haven't thought about much because whenever you think about graphs you probably always think about connected graphs where every single um, vertice can be reached by another vertice with a path that's what we talked about on Tuesday but quite often with graphs they might not be connected this can happen um you know, you imagine you're, say, doing something like Google Maps or something. It's like you, you might have places like islands or s South North Stradbroke Island in Southeast Queensland or, or Tasmania or Kangaroo Island in, in South Australia um, that are essentially all networks of, of nodes and edges like a road map, but they're not actually connected graphs. They're two separate subgraphs. Now, the easiest way that we can check for a given graph, like imagine for a second that this whole thing is a graph. This isn't three graphs. These are three subgraphs that are all part of a broader graph. So this is a non-connected graph. The easiest solution we could do here is to create a component of array, which is essentially just a, a C style array of size V, where we keep track of which component a particular um, vertex is in. And when we say component, we mean subgraph. So each index of this array refers to a vertex and the value at that index refers to which graph it's in. So essentially, if you have a graph like this one here, um, you can figure out how many components there are by you do some searches, which we're about to go through, where you say, okay, well, what component is the vertex one in? And it's in the zeroth graph, right? The zero index graph. And which component is the index five in? Well, it's in the third graph, which is index two. So you essentially have this component of array with like all the vertices, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, where um, it, you're essentially just giving them labels. Are you in graph zero, one, or two, right? So that's kind of what like this connected component approach does. Um, did I, sometimes I accidentally copy and paste slides without realizing. So the algorithm for this, I've made this one really big, is that if you want to figure out how many, um, like to get the components of a graph G, you create your component of array 
which has v and v indices in it. So it's a size v. So in a graph like this, it would be seven elements, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. You create it, you set all the values to negative one as a default to start. Okay. And then you create like a default component ID of zero. So like every graph will have at least one component in it, right? Because it's either a connector graph with one component or it's a series of subgraphs that are all not joined together that are different components. Um, and then what we do is we say for every vertice in graph, we check if the component of like if the component it's in is negative one, i.e. has it has it been assigned a component, and if not, we do a DFS on it, a full DFS. Okay, so like a full traversal of that graph. Uh, now. This algorithms, I think, is like one of those, for me at least, I remember the first time I saw this, it was one of those ones where I was like, what is it doing? And then like it clicked pretty quickly for me after a while, which was that if you say, if you do have a series of disjoint um, graphs like this, like that, then what this algorithm's doing is, is say down here you have your little um, seven seven item array where you know you have um this is for a vertex zero vertex one vertex two vertex three four five and six like that um and what the algorithm does is it says okay well i'm going to set all the values of those to negative one now again i'm not going to write those in because i just couldn't be bothered erasing them but let's assume all these values have um, negative one to start so if they're blank it means that that's negative one then we set a comp ID or the component we're currently exploring is going to be zero. So the component, like the graph, the subgraph we're in now is zero. So I put C comp ID is zero there. Okay, now for every single vertice in V, so for a vertice zero, vertice one, vertice two, all the way up to vertice six, I'm going to check first if it's, uh, if it's component of is negative one. So I'm going to start at zero. Now it's component of is negative one. Okay, like it's negative one because it's blank. So then what I do is I do a DFS on it. I do a DFS on that particular node. So I come up here and I'm going to do a DFS exploration of the entire graph. And how does this DFS exploration work? Well, every single time that I explore a new node as part of my DFS, I mark its component of as the value of the graph I'm in currently. So what's the comp ID at the moment? It's zero. So therefore, the first thing I do when I explore, I cycle the wrong node. The first thing I do when I explore this graph is I set the zero node to be in component zero. And then I go and explore node one as part of my DFS, which is in component zero. And then I go and explore node two, which is part of my DFS, which is in component zero. Now, this is a recursive DFS. So what happens is it, it explores the entire graph recursively. And then once it's found the end, it like unwinds and finishes. And once this function call finishes and we can finally move on, the next thing it does is it increase the comp ID from zero to one like that. Okay. And then what happens is we keep going in this loop because what was this loop we were part of? It was going through all the vertices. So now we go look at vertice one. However, we don't DFS this because there's a check here. If the component of is negative one, so you don't, you don't really do that. So then you check two and the component of that one is ne not negative one. So you don't do that. And then you get to three and you say, oh, this is still negative one. So I can DFS it. So you start at three. The component ID is now one because when we finish the previous DFS, we increase that. So now inside of three, I put one here and then three and four are in that graph. So I put one there and then that entire DFS ends. And now this is two and then the same thing happens here. So this is two and two. So that's what you'd be left with in this case. Um, yeah, so the question was, does it matter if you BFS or DFS? Uh, no, it's all the same. Um, I, again, I think, I think I was reflecting on what I said to you all earlier. So I think a DFS is uh, like, so I would probably do a recursive DFS if I was trying to traverse everything or if I was trying to just do a simple search. Is it in the graph or not? Because it's, it's, it's very quick to code. Um, a BFS I would probably prefer, or an iterative DFS I'd prefer if I was pathfinding, because I find it a little easier to debug, and the logic of that's a bit more complicated, though it's kind of up to you in a lot of ways. Um, 
Waleed says, in an ADT, our disjoint graph would still be a big adjacency list matrix. So how do we find each of these individual subgraphs? Well, an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix is a collection of vertices. And this entire algorithm is based off a collection of vertices. So, you know, it doesn't really matter if there's no edges. This, this algorithm will still behave. Um, last kind of comment, there's no real code to deal with here, but... For applications where knowing whether the graph is connected is critical, um, that components algorithm is quite expensive. It kind of involves searching the entire graph, e even if it's in chunks. So sometimes what you can do is you can actually cache that information in the actual graph representation itself. So yesterday, or sorry, on Tuesday, we looked at all these different graph representations, which had different bits of info in the struct. You can actually put that connected component array, that component of array, in the in the graph itself um, and dynamically kind of um, work with it as you add and remove edges if you want to. Uh, that's not something we go into, but that's something to kind of like think about. And you can actually like, there's a cool little note here, which is that one of the benefits of this is actually if someone says to you, oh, can you help me find a path from A to B? Or let's look in this graph here. Can you help me find a path from zero to five? Rather than trying to DFS that whole first subgraph, you could actually just check in your um, component of array, is 0 and 5 even in the same graph? No, they're not. So there's no point even spending time on that. Okay, last two things. Um, these are things you might have learned in discrete maths, or I mean, I have memories of learning this even in high school um, or a while ago. Um, and that's Hamiltonian paths and Hamiltonian circuits. Now, conceptually, these are very straightforward things to understand. If you have a graph, a connect, you know, series of nodes and edges with cycles in it, a Hamiltonian path is a path that connects two vertices such that the path includes every vertex exactly once. So remember, a path has no cycles. That's a really important, that's a really important like point here. Um, so when we say path, we mean no cycles, but I know I probably have an example on the next slide. I do. I should just stop trying to Google stuff. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a path connecting two vertices such that the path includes all the vertexes in the graph. And a Hamiltonian circuit is the exact same thing. It's just where your start and your end point are the same. So if you look at like a graph like this, 0, 1, 2, 3, a Hamiltonian path has to include all the vertices in it. Um, but only once, okay? So like, because otherwise there's like cycles involved. So it's essentially a way of like, how do we, um, how do we go through this graph touching every single vertex exactly once? Uh, it's not possible for every kind of graph, um, but it, it, you know, there's lots of graph it is, graphs it is possible for. A key point here is that, um, some of the real world applications to this are super interesting. There's like, <coughs> like we, we got here like traveling salesman problem, which we'll talk probably more about in week seven. And then there's like bus routes. So I, I think I even mentioned earlier that example of um, figuring out all of the, uh, like if you have to do, if you have to drop mail off to people or you have to do a garbage truck collection, pick up everyone's garbage, you have to think if houses are vertexes, then your job is to find like, you know, a path between all those houses where every vertex is included at least once. Um, so that's kind of why, why we care about that. Now, a Hamiltonian circuit is one where we, we finish where we start. So if I just like, if I joined these four together, then it would be essentially a, a path through all of the vertexes that ends up where it starts. Now, um, in terms of in terms of the approach to the Hamiltonian path search problem, like if you have a graph and you're trying to find a Hamiltonian path, it is a very expensive exercise because the first thing you do is you have to essentially DFS all possible paths. Um, and then you have to keep a counter of vertices visited um, kind of in each path and then it's just it's essentially one of these like uh kind of brute brute algorithms where you um 
you're kind of just DFSing until you find a path with all the vertices in it. Um, because you might be thinking, oh, we can just use a DFS for that. And it's like, not really, because the DFS is not trying to find a path, right? Like when, when you do a full traversal, as I've been referring to it in a DFS graph, like if you take a graph like this, there's a big difference between fully traversing a graph with a DFS by going like, you know, I'm gonna, oh, I might use a different color, by going like, oh, here and here and here and here and let's backtrack and here, oh, can't do, sorry, here and here and let's backtrack and then go here and then here and then here and then here and then we found everything. But this isn't a path, right? Because a path, as we talked about on Tuesday, is like a linear movement between things because this breaks the path here. So you think, okay, that's not it, damn it. Well, maybe I can try this one. Oh, now I'm backtracking again. That's not a path. And, you know, some, some things just don't have paths. Um, I mean, I know there's these red lines here, which I've kind of neglected. You know, maybe this one does. This one seems to. Right? You don't have to use all the edges. But that has a, Hamil that has a Hamiltonian path in it. But the point is there's no, there's no, like, simple algorithm to just, like, find it like there is, you know, with, with some other things. It's, it's very much like a, you kind of have to just try DFS out in a whole bunch of different arrangements. Um, so you have to find a DFS solution um, with um, all, all, the, all the vertices in it that's still a path. So it's, it's very similar to pathfinding algorithms. It's just that you want to find the biggest path. Here's kind of the pseudo code for it. Um, We're not going to talk about that extensively at the moment. Like, I, I, me just kind of talking about this for 60 seconds is not going to achieve a lot. Um, you know, spend the time trying to get your head around this. I mean, one, one of these things, like, I really prefer to try and intuitively figure it out and then look back at the algorithm. Um, or Tomnell says, why is it necessary to have no backtracking? Well... I don't want to say that backtracking is not allowed. It's the idea that like a path visits each vertex once. So if you backtrack, you're technically visiting a vertex a second time. So this is no longer a path, not because you're backtracking. That's just how I think about it. Um, it's because you are visiting two twice now. So you visit one, two, five, two, four. So you visit a two twice. So essentially when you're exploring with a Hamilton path, Hamiltonian path, you can't backtrack because you can't visit the same node again. So if I get here, I'm stuck because all of my neighbors I visited before and I can't visit a node twice. So then I need to figure out a different way through it. Um, so it's, it's a complicated problem to solve. And, you know, this particular algorithm here, um, Hamiltonian path recursive, Yeah, this, this one is essentially just, it's it's a little bit like a depth first search, except that it, it, kind, it kind of unwinds as it goes and then looks down different paths. So, you know, if, if you're trying to explore it like this and then you go down here and then you go down here and you go down here and you go down here, and then you come here, that's a dead end. You can't go that way. So then you might have to come here and then go there. But now you haven't explored all the vertices. So maybe you have to go back again and like, you know, think about a different way to go through it. But then it's, you know what I mean? So it's, we're, in week seven, we're going to talk about brute force algorithms, but essentially any kind of algorithm where you're um, kind of like just having to try all the goddamn possibilities in the world, um, they get very complex very quickly. So that's why like Hamiltonian pathfinding is really hard because you essentially have to just explore it. There's no, there's no deterministic way to figure it out quickly. Um, and this is interesting because in terms of like, if you were to do the time complexity of finding a Hamiltonian path, the actual time complexity of it is V minus one factorial. Now this kind of makes sense in a way because like, what is a factorial time complexity? Um, it's like a swipe thing on a phone. You know how on a phone, like, um, you sometimes, uh, like why are phone pins and stuff really hard to guess? It's because they're non it's they're they're kind of exponential or factorial problems. They're really complicated to solve to guess everything. Um, 
because it's a whole bunch. It's a permutation essentially. Like you're trying to look through all the different permutations of lines through the graph. So a factorial time complexity um, problem is uh, it's a class of problem that we're going to talk about more in week seven called NP hard or essentially you know we'll talk about that more in week seven, but essentially it's uh, it's very hard to do. A computer would take a long time to run through all these different possibilities. So this would be a massive recursive branch of um, different possibilities here. Because each, each recursive call is just doing like another series of four eaches and stuff, but um, yeah, so very, very complex to do. So there's the algorithm. The gist of it again is it's a DFS that's like having to try every possible permutation because a normal dfs will just only like think about a normal dfs simply goes through until it touches every node that's why its complexity is v plus e it's quite quick actually but to find a dfs that that finds you that does a traversal under a particular pattern right where it's like you only touch each vertex once you have to try a lot of different possibilities now euler paths and circuits mm, euler um are the last thing we want to talk about today. And they are a very similar but slightly different type of problem where you want to find a path connecting to vertexes or vertices such that the path includes every edge in your graph exactly once. So Euler paths and Hamiltonian paths are kind of inverse in the sense that a Hamiltonian path is saying, I need every vertex in this, but I don't need every edge in it. And an Euler path is saying, I need every edge in this, but I don't need every vertex in it. Okay, so one of them's trying to get every ed vertex, and the other one's trying to get every edge in the graph. Very similarly, an Euler circuit um, is an Euler path where the start and vertex is the end. So this understanding of paths and circuits is identical. It's like, if you finish where you start, it's a circuit. If you don't, it's just a path. Now, um, Real world applications for this, I've kind of been throwing these examples around very generally about like, you know, postage and um, garbage trucks and stuff. But it really depends how your graph is represented. Um, for instance, like the reason that the reason that the actual postage and garbage truck delivery examples actually make more sense here is because you could represent a graph that um, is like an entire city where like each house is like a, a, a node that's like connected and like sure that kind of makes sense though like a better way to represent it is like if you imagine your street block where every intersection is a um uh you know is a node and and the street between your intersections or edges then it actually makes sense why you'd want to use an Euler method here to figure out where a garbage truck should go. Because in this sense, all the houses are actually sitting along the road or the edges. And a garbage truck's job is to essentially, like think about it, a garbage truck and post delivery is to go, go down every single street that exists. Okay. Um, so if you can find a method where you can visit every single street exactly once, you're going to save on fuel costs. Right? You're going to have explored the entire graph having... Um, you're going to explore all the edges in the graph without ever having to visit an edge twice. So definitely kind of super cool, whereas like the Hamiltonian path one is more like... Um, uh, kind of like bus routes, because like when you think about bus routes, a bus route is defined as like, I need to visit this point and this point and this point and this point. And then I have all these edges between them to help me get there. So a bus doesn't have a need to visit every, go down every road in Sydney, right? It has a desire to go to every bus stop in Sydney. Um, whereas like, you know, garbage trucks, postage deliveries, they're trying to go down every road in Sydney to do something. So just different kinds of problems here that are helping us solve things. Now, um, yeah, so Ma Matthew's spot on here. Um, is there a method to, to do it all exactly twice? Because a garbage truck would need to hit both sides. So yes, it is a simplified model, of course. Um, the way you could deal with this is by having a directed um, graph where most streets have arrows going both ways. Um, that's probably the way you would normally solve it, I would guess. Um, or you could get a garbage truck with really long arms that just picks both up at the same time. But yes, it's, this is slightly oversimplified. 
so I feel like there's a graph that I should have started with here. I'm missing. Am I missing a graph? Give me a sec. So I, I, I there's a half of the stuff I, I pull from previous lectures. I'm just trying to figure out. Nope. Nope. That was, that was it. Um, so a Euler path is because this is kind of deceiving, right? Because like if I um, let me just copy this again. So the original graph for this one might have looked something like. Um, <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it might have looked something like this, where um, all of these nodes are connected, like that. Yep. Um, and a Euler path is essentially us trying to. Oh no, it's not. Sorry, I'm going crazy. I was thinking about um, uh, the Hamiltonian paths for a sec. So, a Euler path in a graph is trying to visit every edge once. I understand. I was, I've confused myself for the last 30 seconds. Please disregard what I've said. So, if this is a whole graph here, this one does have a Euler path because you can... Thank you, Euler. Thank you. This one does have an Euler path because um, you can visit every edge here in a single path without visiting any, any edge twice. Whereas some other graphs that is just not possible in. For instance, if you have a graph like, um, say, this kind of graph, some, it's like some graphs, uh, I'm not going to be able to make one right off the top of my head, but um, there could be a graph like this one here, for instance, where you can't really visit each edge once. Like if you try and traverse it, you're going to get stuck at some point. You're going to miss some edges. Um, like you could do this one here. Oh, that's okay actually. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make one up. But the point is, you have to be able to explore every single edge in the graph once without covering it again for it to be an Euler path. Now, an Euler circuit is where you can do that exact thing. You can visit all the edges, but where you finish, your last edge traversal takes you back exactly to where you started. Um, the uh, whole origin or genesis of this was from Leonard Euler, who was trying to find a way to cross all the bridges of, um, I always forget how to pronounce this, Konigsberg, um, exactly once to walk through the town. So you imagine you have this little cute, you know, uh, European town and you have all these bridges and you want to take someone and see the entire town, but you don't want them to have to cover the same ground twice. Okay. Um, so if you represent that town like a graph over here, where you have like the north bank and the south bank and the island and the east bank, is there a way where we can visit every edge in this graph um, once? You know, you got go here, 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 and I don't, I don't know if there is, is there is in that one? I can't remember. Um, no, there's not. Um, no, don't think so. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but um, if you were to just brute force this like we did with Hamiltonian part, with Hamiltonian paths, it would be ON as well, and factorial, because you'd essentially have to go and like permutate all the different things. However, um, what's really great is that for this particular algorithm, there's actually a really easy way to tell really quickly, like polynomially quickly that um, whether it has an Euler path or an Euler circuit or not. So first thing is, is that a graph has an Euler circuit if the degree of every vertice in a connected graph is even. So what we mean by that is that, you know, if you have a graph, like look at these ones here, um, every vertice here has exactly two neighbors. That makes its degree two. Okay, so you know it has an Euler circuit if um, every single uh, vertice has a degree of two, has two neighbors. And you know it's an Euler path if all the vertices have an even um, uh, number of neighbors, except two which have an odd number. So you look at a graph like this, this has, this one has one neighbor, this one has two neighbors, 
this one has three neighbors, this one has two, and this one has one. So if you can find a graph, oh sorry, two, 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 two. Um, so if you can find a graph like this, where they all have even neighbors, an even number of neighbors, except two of them have odd, then you'll find a Euler path in it. So that's how at a glance you can see something like this and say, does it have an Euler path or circuit through it? And the answer is no, because N has three neighbors, E has three neighbors, I has five, and S has three. So four of them have odd, an odd number of neighbors or an odd, ver uh, odd degree. So that's kind of the telling sign of it. So actually really easy to tell. And that actually makes the, um, the, the look for it really easy. So if you want to tell if something has a, an Euler path in it, um, in a connected graph, it's actually OV time complexity, which is really quick. Um, if, you, if you can look up the degree instantly. Basically, if each vertex already knows what its degree is, then it's OV. However, if you need to calculate the degree or the number of neighbors of each vertex, then it's OV squared because, you know, you have to do it for each vertex. So there's like calculating it for each vertex and then plug it into the algorithm. So it's just V times V in that case, which is V squared. Um, because it's 356, we're pretty much at the end here. So I'll answer any couple of questions while we do feedback um, form thing. So... Um, but yeah, that's, it's really interesting. So Hamiltonian paths, Euler paths, different, different priorities. One wants all vertices, one wants all edges. Euler paths have a cute little trick where you can tell if they exist just by doing some really fairly quick lookups. Hamiltonian paths, there's no straightforward way to solve that problem. Cool. Okay. Well... I'm going to wrap it up there because it's about to be 357. Um, and again, I know we do go lightly through some of these topics. Of course, you can ask your tutor about them in the tutes and stuff as well um, and learn a little bit more about them. Um, last question I'll answer. So while Ed says the Hamiltonian paths and cycles algorithm you touched upon are really complicated to run through, even on simpler graphs. So it's just about knowing the algos and what they are. Um, the actual algorithm itself is not complicated for Hamiltonian paths. It's just that it's a really computationally heavy exercise. Does a lot, it requires a lot of processing. Um, so that's the difficulty in it. And Nayuki says, do we have to memorize all of the pseudocode in case when HR... HR? What's that? It's not human resources. Anyway. Um, oh, HR, oh, you mean like, oh, like hiring uh, recruiters. Sure, okay. Um, do you have to memorize all the pseudocode? Uh, no, like... No, not in my experience. Most of the time, most, like... No, not, not everything. So like just to really quickly run through it, it's like if you were trying to prepare for tech interviews tomorrow, you should definitely, like you'd definitely be wanting to be comfortable with recursion. You'd definitely be wanting to talk about big O notation for algorithms. Um, you definitely want to know how to deal with trees and maybe rebalancing trees. That could be a stretch. I don't think you're likely to run into too many of... Um, these kinds of questions at most places from what I've seen, you'd, you'd be dealing with a pretty hard interview if they were to just kind of spring like a, some kind of B, like a B tree structure. The main reason with some of this stuff is because it's too hard to extract things from you in like an interview time. Like it's very hard to talk to you for like 20 minutes and be like, write me up a B tree of degree five. Um, pretty much everything we talked about, I think a lot of graph stuff's definitely relevant, particularly the traversal stuff. Um, to be honest with you, most things in this course, I'd say like 80% of things in this course are relevant, but no, some things like, um, Hamiltonian paths, you're not going to get asked to like, um, write a Hamiltonian path solver <laughs> during, during an interview, I don't think. Um, uh, Matthew says, would you have, would you have rotating trees memorized or do you normally search that stuff up? It's a minute till four o'clock, so I don't feel kind of comfortable giving a good answer on this question, but most interviews are bound by the laws of reality, whereby 
if someone's asking you to write some code to rotate a tree, then they're either giving you a whole bunch of code which is already written to deal with trees which you need to spend time reading through or they're going to try and ask you to write the code to actually deal with the tree up front. Um, so, you know, there's there's just some limitations. It's like high school when you're guessing uh, what the exam questions are for the HSC and stuff. It's like they could ask you anything in theory, but like a lot of... You can rule out a lot of things just by like... Is that even possible to, to really have a meaningful question for in 30 minutes or something? So, um, yeah, most of it is the short answer. But anyway, thanks, everyone. Hope you have a great day and I'll see you next... Oh, I'll see you in week seven. Good luck with Flex Week and enjoying what break you may or may not have. So thanks, everyone.